struggling with a chronic condition or they're focused on just feeling their best, our goal is, and we're, is that we're committed to each and every one of them to meet them in a place that's mutually comfortable for them to help them to be successful. Um, today we're going to spend some time talking a little bit about mindfulness. And, uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to point out all of you have a paper bag, and I know we're a paper bag to start, on the side of your table. All right, so we're starting off really good. I would just ask that you keep the paper bag closed until, and we'll talk a little bit about it. And uh, as it says on the bag, all good things are worth waiting for. So we'll find out how those apply. So I'll be watching everybody. There's a little buzzer that's going to go off if anybody opens it before we get started. In, in 1948, the World Health Organization, and that's the other who, uh, defined health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being in not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. That's a pretty powerful definition and if you think about 64 years later, that definition still exists. We have to think about in our society, in our culture, what lasts for 64 years. There's not too much. But that definition of really a holistic view on the individual has really been a, a very applicable and reused portion that we've just looked forward. So in 1948, I don't think that they probably ever thought that how it would catch on in, in the industry as well in the marketplace. If we think about it though, as important as it is to think about that definition, some of the things that have not gone away as well in that 64 year period is we've seen a constant rise in obesity, a constant rise in stress. We've also seen a significant increase in chronic conditions where we see people with two or more chronic conditions. I think all of us are here for the vested interest of everyone, which is how do we help to improve the quality of life and bring affordable care? And that's really where we're looking, when we've spent some time looking at things like mindfulness and the impacts on it, it's really been very telling on how we can look at some of the non-traditional methodologies to actually bring forward some really key, key solutions and outcomes. So just by show of hands, how many of you have no stress in your jobs or your career? Oh, I saw one raise a hand. This is good. This is the person you're going to want to talk to right up here. Uh, and so I, I actually saw no hands, which is probably not uncommon. I think each of us have a different stress level in our lives. And, you know, when we think about it and when, we, when you look at, when we talk with physicians, when, we, when you read some of the literature that's come out, there is a constant increase in stress-related conditions and stress-related incidents, or at least symptoms, that are coming through the physician's office. Sometimes it, people don't even realize that's the underlying basis for it. Many times when we think about weight, we think about tobacco, the use of tobacco, we think about why people are sometimes depressed. Stress is quite often the most underlying reason for all of those things. When we're coaching and we're, we're focusing on a one-to-one -one or a, a group relationship with someone to help to improve those outcomes, we very often will step back and not look at, it's not about exercise, it's not about nutrition, but let's talk about what in your life has really impacted you. And that's where stress usually comes up. Now nobody wants to be labeled as stressed, right? We sit, we sit in our offices or our desks and we're frantic, but we don't want to be called stressed. We know we are, but and if, for those of us that have a chronic leg problem, I have mine, mine shakes. I could probably drive fast, just as fast as my leg goes, uh, but it's, it's really part of who we are. Stress is not just about the physical either. If we think about, it, it really, if we think about the definition that we talked about from the World Health Organization, it also impacts our mental and our emotional state. If you think about your build, building relationships and you think about the, th sometimes when you can't make a decision or you become indecisive, sometimes when you get distracted and you start one thing and then start a different thing, stress is often the underlier behind it. Again, we don't always attribute it back to it, but when we lose focus most of the time, there's always something else that we're thinking about. And it's usually because of something that's caused us stress, whether you had a, an unhappy discussion with your boss or with a coworker, whether you found out some news that's had a direct impact on you, or even if you think about the fact that you're not sleeping at night, uh, how many of you may wake up at three o'clock in the morning and say, well, when I couldn't sleep last night, I did a few things or I wrote a list besides my bed. 
again, it's an example of how we release stress in, in, in our, each of our lives. The other piece to think about is, is it, we all respond very differently to it, and that's really where we're going to start to get into. Left. So this is my sec second technology flip for today, so I'm due for one more before we leave the room. <laughs> the third piece is really around, if we think about the effects and we think about how mentally it impacts us, whether it's through relationships, it's through our ability to feel comfortable, if our palms are sweating, if our stomach has a knot in it, or if there's anything else that's there. But if you think about, if you had a chronic condition of stress, meaning you couldn't manage stress, um, it would almost be impossible for any of us to eliminate it, except for some of our guests here today that have said that they didn't have any. But for most of us, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to eliminate. But to manage the stress within our own environment is a key. But left unaddressed, the chronic effects can be much more telling over long term. And in fact, when we started to do some analysis on those impacts, we actually saw that an individual, there was a direct correlation between someone who reported that they had high stress and an increase in claim activity and almost to the upwards of $2,000 of an impact. So if you think about that across a multi-employee population over time, that can have a direct impact on your bottom line. So the question is, what do we do about it? And this is where we, we really kind of shift gears and how does mindfulness and how can mindfulness play a role in it? Just by show of hands, how many of you are familiar with, with mindfulness or the concept of it? Good. There's a good number of you, and we're going to spend a little time today talking about what it is, and then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a study that we had conducted as well on how mindfulness played a role and actually had a positive impact on some of the things that we just talked about in terms of overall effects. But before we can start that, I do want to show you a quick Kung Fu Panda movie, and how many of you have seen Kung Fu Panda? Yeah. Okay. And there's even more hands that have seen Kung Fu Panda than mindfulness, so that's a good, <laughs> that's a good start. But I want you to just listen to the, the conversation that they're having. So we, we, we sometimes the best things we learn are from our children. This is a chance for us to just step back and just listen. And I want everybody just for the next minute to put down their blackberries or anything, other thoughts that you're having and just concentrate on what they're telling. And I just want, to make sure, want everybody to hear the message that's coming through. This might be my third technology flaw for today. But. I'm so sorry. I thought it was just a regular peach tree. I understand. You eat when you are upset. Upset? I'm not upset. Why am why, 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 I upset? So why are you upset? <sighs> I probably sucked more today than anyone in the history of Kung Fu, in the history of China, in the history of sucking. Probably. And the five. Man, you should have seen them. They totally hate me. Totally. How's Shifu ever going to turn me into the Dragon Warrior? I mean, I'm not like the Five. I've got no claws, no wings, no venom. Even Mantis has those thingies. <sighs> Maybe I should just quit and go back to making noodles. Quit. Don't quit. Noodles. Don't noodles. You are too concerned with what was and what will be. There's a saying. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. But today is a gift. That is why it is called the present. So when you're at the movie theater the next time, you'll think about those messages that are, that are hidden within. Can anybody tell me what they, what they think they heard in that, in that clip? Keep present. Keep, keep, keep present, exactly. And the important, the, really the value, if we think about why that's important, we can't control what's in the past, and we can't control what's going to happen tomorrow. We can plan for it, but we can't control it. But being present means you're better enabling yourself and positioning yourself for whatever may come. And part of it is when we think about mindfulness, and this is where we're going to start, we're going to do an exercise next because not only I want to make sure everybody really understands this concept. So when we start talking about how it plays in, you can understand really how it becomes, you become one with the present. But when somebody is struggling to do something, and I'll use a personal example for myself, if my first reaction when I am stressed is to take a flight approach 
which means I internally look, I become quiet, I disengage. So I may be physically there, I may be physically present, but emotionally and mentally, I've just dis disconnected from that discussion. You get a, f a blank facial expression, and I've shut it off. If I use a fight reaction, I'm jumping down, I'm standing up, I'm throwing my hand in the air, I'm showing a lot of passion behind the topic that's at hand. Sometimes I could even be argumentative. In many cases, if you think even in New York City just recently, there was an individual who fell on the subway track and there were two people that ran and pulled that person off before the, the oncoming subway train came. That's an example of fight response. They were able to do it like that. And that's generally, if you think about the moment in time when you have to respond or react to something, we all take it and we do it. Part of controlling, whether it's through eating or it's through different types of stressors in our life, we have to control it before it gets there. It means changing a behavior, and that's really what we're all thinking about. How do we help to change the behavior? But you have to be, it has to become embodied in what you do. So mindfulness helps us to focus on that and get control of the environment before the stressor comes in. So now, everyone, I had promised that you would get to open the bags. So what I just ask you to do is if there's a, each of you has a paper bag, there is a chocolate and, and there's a box of raisins and they're, they're all wrapped, I promise. Each of you can pick whatever you would prefer. Uh, whatever happens in Salon E stays in Salon E. So if you pick the chocolate, we're not going to judge you. I promise this is not a conversation on, on food choices. Uh, but I want you to pick the, and don't open it until I give the instructions. So I'm going to give you very specific directions on what we're going to do with this. If for some reason you run out of your favorite choice, there should be plenty across the room so you can pick. If you don't like chocolate or raisins, you are welcome to use something else that you might have, a food item that you have in your own bag. Okay. Can everybody just hold up what they picked? Oh, chocolate was popular today. The raisins were too. Like I said, there's no judgment. So what I want you to do is I want you to hold that up and I want you to tell me what you see. Just describe it. What are you, what are you seeing right now? Think about it from, we're, and again, we're just focused on this one thing. Anybody? There's no right answer. I said more. You said more, okay. Shiny? Hugs. I'm sorry, hugs? Okay. Hugs. Hugs. Kisses. Okay. Kisses, hugs, kisses, yeah. Okay, good. All right, now... I would like you to take a moment, and I want you to touch it. Just, just feel it. I know we normally don't play with our food this way, but we're gonna, we're gonna, this is the one time that it's okay. I want you to touch it. I want you to, to really under, see it. Now, what can you tell me you've felt on, with the food? I know there's chocolate in there. You know there's chocolate, okay. And that's just from touching it. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it's smooth. Good. So now two, so two of your perceptions, you really, if you think about your sensory nerves, you've, you've found two things. Here's the next for you. Put it up to your ear. If it talks to you, there is a program for that too. But <laughs> <laughs> what happened when you put it up to your ear? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So some of you heard some jingling. That's, okay. that's good. Okay. If your lunch decision came through too, that's okay. All right, so the next piece I want you to do is just, I want you to take a, a just put up to your nose now and take a good smell, okay? And any reactions from smelling? Okay, good. So what's your mouth doing right now? It's watering. So your body, just from using four senses of looking at it, and probably because we've over-talked about it, but you've, you've listened to it, you've touched it, and now your mouth is responding to that. So your body is working together. Now think about when you're eating a meal at home, how often do you stop and actually taste the food before you eat it? That's a challenge for some of us, and probably most of us, because most of the time it's just we're talking, we're eating, we're not always putting our fork down. Part of, again, this is becoming one with the food. Now I don't expect you to eat every meal this way because you'll need three or four hours a day to, to eat, but the part of it is just, again, starting to take that perception. All right, so now you can unwrap, but don't, I don't want you to eat it and swallow it. So this is, you're gonna do, we're gonna do this step by step. This is called good discipline and, and uh, mindfulness meditation, right? 
All right, so now you can put in, if you, you can put just, if you have a raisin, you can just take one raisin. If you have the chocolate, you can just put that in your mouth. Okay, but again, you're not chewing it, you're just keeping it there, so you're savoring it in your mouth. Okay, so now you can take one bite, but don't swallow it. Okay, and just, you know, roll it around a little bit, have fun with it. It might be like a good glass of wine, you appreciate it. Okay, take another bite. Okay, you can, take, you can take five more bites, and then you can swallow it. I've macerated it. You've macerated it. Good, that's good. Okay. okay. So just a reaction, besides this probably feeling a little bit awkward, which I would acknowledge that it probably does, what, what, does, what were your reactions from that experience? What did you, did anybody come away with anything? You can tell me nothing, too. That's, but did you, did you get a reaction from... Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you, she had, so up here she had said that there's different, you know, based on the fact that she was eating the food, it, she was getting impatient, she wanted to have it, which is a normal reaction, and that's good because you recognize that that was a reaction. Other thoughts? Slow motion. How did that feel? Actually good. Okay. Good. There you go. <laughs> That's right. We weren't going to test you if it did. So each. A level of awareness of what it actually is. That's right. That's right. Yep. Absolutely. And if you, as, as we thought about this, again, I know this is a little different way to think about it, but what I'm hoping everyone came away from both, of the, both the video and this is it really is about the, the present and experiencing what's happening. As we had talked about, you can't really control what happened before and you can't happen in the future, but uh, just the example that Betsy had shared with us about the impatience, that's again recognizing a sign and what you could do to change that. Probably the answer would be eating it faster so I didn't become impatient, but it starts to recognize what those core needs are and, and again, you're listening to what your body is telling you. You're listening to what you, the reactions that you're having, what the responses are. If your stomach is hungry, you know, there's a difference between a craving and being hungry. So it is understanding, again, what your body's telling you, and that's how mindfulness really makes that real. Um, it's very specific and it's very intentional. Uh, it's, it's often on purpose. So you, again, because we did this intentionally, we were focusing it step by step. It talk, we talked a lot about the present moment, but you're doing it without judgment as well. Each of us has a different, we each have different perceptions around things. It's okay to be very gradual. It's, it's okay to think about it. It's okay to stop and take a deep breath. So as we, as, as we evaluated mindfulness and the role that it played, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a study that we had conducted, and, and this is one study that we're spending some time on. We've done some other analyses as well on, on mindfulness and the impacts, and, and in many cases, it's, 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 this specifically is really related to stress. And, and there was a study, and this is something that's very relevant in the marketplace. Things have changed over the last few years. Uh, if you mentioned mindfulness about 10 years ago, people would look at you very awkwardly, like one, what is it? And two, why are we talking about this? Why are we having this discussion? This is, it's, it's too touchy-feely for me. And those are, those are not uncommon thoughts. I think the perception, and I've even had some discussions with some of you even before, how, of how <laughs> mindfulness really starts to play a very different role. Um, through this, the study itself, it was really conducted in conjunction with Duke Integrative Medicine. And as part of that study, it was really based on two approaches. Uh, one was using a mindfulness-based classroom, and it was both in-person as well as virtual. And we also used a concept called Vini Yoga. And Vini Yoga is a little different than our traditional yoga and thinking, and thinking about it as more of a therapeutic yoga. It does not mean that you have to be an expert at yoga to, to participate in a Vini Yoga class. It's a very thoughtful, very careful methodology that you really start to, again, practice and understand what your body is, is telling you and recognizing what the different sensories within, your, within yourself are outwardly thinking. As part of that, uh, we, we pulled together a, a, really a study group. And within that study group, there were really five arms that we'll talk about in just a moment. But within these populations, we really wanted to test a couple of different things. One, could mindfulness really play a role in helping to improve, if not reverse, some of the risk factors, whether it was, it was just related to stress, whether it was a physical reaction, such as high blood pressure, 
could have been high cholesterol, lower back pain, or could it even be related to other things like a chronic condition? So evaluating and understanding how did this have an impact. Two, we wanted to understand would someone really utilize this delivery method? And is there, is there a comfort in, in, in actually thinking about this approach? As we looked at the, the overall methodology, it was really about bringing people together and, and leveraging these new, these capabilities, the tech, not only the technology, but also having individuals that could really focus on mindfulness. Um, there were five legs of the study. Uh, one was really a core control group. And our control group was set up in a way that was very specific to the really, not really changing anything, just providing information that, they, that individuals already had access to, providing information on programs that those individuals may already have access to, but not really changing their environment or the conditions. That group, as you can imagine, uh, as we looked at this population, it was a random select study. So individuals could not go in and actually pick which, which leg of the study that they would be selected, but they were aware that there would be multiple channels for them to participate in. The second was really through the, the, the virtual mind, mindful classroom as well as the in-person classroom. And this again was instructor-led, regardless if it was virtual or in-person. And as part of that direct, the direct relationship, there was also homework assignments that were given. And within that session, there was practice on the use of mindfulness, so how to understand what, what your triggers were, understanding how to focus on meditation, understanding how to breathe, but then also understanding what you could do differently to help to control that. Each individual participated in that class really starting out with their own, their own goals and then really working towards a common goal. The third leg was really around Vinny Yoga and that was done in person and there were really two separate legs that were tested. The first was specific to individuals that would, would meet with the yoga instructor and they would have homework assignments that were, were related to the session. There was a second leg of the study that we tested to see if they needed additional support, keeping in mind that many of these individuals may never have done yoga before. The DVD support was a, a walkthrough tool that helped them, and the, the hypothesis was that a, a DVD would be required or some additional support to help individuals when they were outside of, outside of their sessions. There were 12 sessions set at one hour apiece. And the individuals, we were really looking for individuals who would be able to commit some time to, to really participate in each of those events. Um, we, had, we had an 80 87% continuance rate. And generally what we were seeing were, were individuals who would participate in the activities, they would continue with, they would continue with their particular mode through the entire study. And then those individuals who it was in terms of kind of retaining those individuals, um, that we did actually offer an incentive to keep them throughout the 12 weeks. Now, in order to prepare for the, the study, because as we were looking at, what, you know, what could we specifically measure and what would our results be? We did, do, we did conduct biometric screenings, which did focus on things like blood pressure and cholesterol. We also introduced a productivity study through a, a work-life questionnaire, as well as we evaluated their quality of sleep, level of chronic pain, their engagement with really a focus on kind of this mindfulness behavior through a very standard questionnaire. We also did an assessment of breathing rate. Each of those measurements were really intended to understand not only were the, the psychological, and emotional pieces were the being addressed through a reduction in stress or at least better management of self-reported stress, but also did we have an impact on their physiological health as well. As we continued through, as, as we continued through really the study itself, uh, through the 12-week period, we did conduct the post-evaluation two weeks after completion. And as we started to look at some of those results, uh, one, we did actually see an improvement in, in people's reported stress. So as part of that specific relationship, individuals had identified that for the perceived stress scale, it's a 50-point scale today. In, uh, many individuals, as we were looking at them, started off at a 27 or higher, and that was uh, a really uh, the majority of our population, as we looked at kind of those key results, started off at the higher level. As we looked at, at the improvements, those individuals actually reported to going to a lower, whether it was in the 
to below, it was really below 26. Um, and many individuals actually got down to what we'd call a normal range, which would be anywhere between 16 and 20. In addition, as we looked at the, t the two methodologies, we did see some, imp we did see a kind of higher uptake in the mindfulness-based class, although Vini Yoga was extremely close. Um, and, and when we looked at the results, and as, as Duke evaluated as well, all were considered to be statistically significant based on the fact that we did have, the, we had the right core population and the results themselves within both the control group and the, the test populations uh, were showing comparative levels. We also did see improvements in sleep as well as also the, a change in people's reported pain, meaning they were better able to manage and control their pain through using mindfulness and yoga as a way to address that. As we also looked at things, improvements in blood pressure, as well as breathing rate, uh, we, did see, we did see some continuous improvement overall in, in, that, in that general factor. Um, as we looked at things like depression, uh, there were even slight improvements for individuals as they reported the fact that they, they felt very depressed, they may have been unproductive as a result of their depression, but, but as they started to work through and at the end of the 12-week period, they did continue to improve those results as well. As we look at, as we started to look further at the impacts, uh, not only did we see some positive results, we wanted to start to look at data and look at claim data it was, as it was related. Um, and we did actually see that there was a direct correlation, and I had mentioned earlier about the five, po really there's the five point scale for the stress, uh, for st stress evaluation. And individuals really within that, to that far right, all right, well there's my, that is my third with a laser. The, those individuals that fell to the, the right side, which, which were really the rep highest reported stress levels over 27, they did have, as we looked back a year prior to the study and then looked at the year as well in conjunction, uh, they did have the highest reported claim impact as well. Now we're not sure that based on those results that there was, it was specific to the fact that an individual that it was all stress related in terms of their claim analysis. That's something that will be conducted down the road. Uh, but in terms of kind of the core evaluation, it did, there did, was a higher prevalence of either chronic condition and or uh, claim usage based on that, that group. As we talk about the study, uh, we've also done a, a fair amount of analysis on mind-body as, as it's related to mindful eating. So similar to what we talked about in the exercise that we had done today, we really focused on how do we help to adjust and change people's eating habits. And it, it's not, again, just related to the amount of exercise and the, the types of foods people are eating, but understanding what specifically is the driver behind those things. As we've continued to evaluate the results as we've conducted that study, we've actually started to see improvements in people's levels as they've been retested for metabolic syndrome, and we've actually seen an improvement f by at least one metabolic figure, whether it's, it's, it's reduction in weight or it's even improvements in cholesterol or even blood pressure. As we've continued to look, this is an area of, of, of focus as we think about not only from the perspective of how does mindfulness play in the role of healthcare, but the industry has taken notice, as we've talked about. There's a lot of press out there overall that has, has started to really understand how mindfulness go goes mainstream. As you look at it, different employers, uh, even if you look at the military, each of, each of those respective organizations has taken and embraced mindfulness in a very different way. And, and they're using it with employee populations, they're using it in large community areas, to help to, to start to change and drive those outcomes. So I'm gonna just pause again, I just have one more exercise for you and then I'm gonna actually open it up for questions. Um, I want you to take a look at the picture that you see in front of you. And can anyone just give me, give me tell me what they see in that picture? I'm sorry? Peace? Okay, peaceful, good. Ooh. Okay. Well, and that's right. There is a baby in that picture. So for those of you that didn't see it, you can see the eye here. So 
So once you once you've seen that baby, you will never miss it again. No, you can't stop seeing it. That's exactly right. And as we, and it's interesting because when I had first looked at this picture, I had the same. I, I saw the people. I saw the kind of what I considered to be more obvious in the, the picture. Uh, but the the baby itself is, you know, being able to see that is really the taking it and seeing things through a new lens. The, the, as we've discussed today, and we think about how mindfulness plays in, it really is thinking about things through a slightly different lens. It's about behavior change in our own lives. It's about impacts to each of us in recognizing what our triggers are. Sometimes they're hidden like that baby is. And so we have to look at things through. But if you know that those things are there in advance, mindfulness can play a role in that. And as we've seen with some of the analysis and some of the specific results, it can also have a positive impact on changes in life behavior, which down the road we see as having an impact on, on people's overall health and well-being. So with that, I will open up for, for questions. Okay. And there is a microphone here in the center. We can either come around with it or if, if you want to come in, just so everybody can hear the questions. And I'll do my best to repeat them, too. If anyone has a question, they can raise their hand. Uh, you reported the results in terms of means. Was there anything interesting on variations within the groups, like whether there's a normal distribution or sure. bimodal? Some, mm -hmm. some people responded dramatically and others sure. didn't respond at all? Sure. Uh, the, what, we, what we actually had seen, Bob, in specifically as it related, was that the online, the online actually had a higher uptake, and we had actually greater consistency with participation throughout the program versus the in-person sessions. And we actually, regardless if they were doing the mind-body class or they were doing the, the yoga class, the, the virtual class actually was where we saw the, the greatest, greatest participation overall. Uh, we also, in terms of the, d in, when we talked a little bit about the DVD, uh, the DVD versus not using the DVD actually did not have any, any significance at all. So there really was nothing that had come out of it specifically to indicate that there was an improvement or that there was a higher level of engagement. It was a fairly normal distribution with yoga overall, uh, so we didn't see enough of a difference between the, the two groups. Uh, there, it was it was like a it was a, just like a tenth of a point higher for the group with the DVD, but again, it wasn't it wasn't statistically significant in that case. Uh, do you intend to remeasure these groups at different points in time to see about the longe longevity of the effect? Mm -hmm. Yes, we would like to actually, we are doing, we actually conducted an evaluation of the population for those individuals that were, were still consistent in terms of, of actually being accessible at this point. Uh, so we are, we have been doing some, uh, the bio, we're actually conducting the biometrics for those individuals that are, that are willing to participate. We don't have those results back yet, so we're kind of looking at it at like a year, like a year and a half view, and then we'll look at a two-year view as well. In, in the slide you had of um, medical usage and stress, mm -hmm. um, which way round does things go? Do things go? Is it that they're more stressed because they have a greater burden of illness so that their day-to-day -day coping is worse? So did you at any t make any attempt to equalize mm -hmm. the burden of illness to make sure that that didn't? We did. Part of the perceived stress questionnaire, as well as some of the other things that we were evaluating during the study, was really looking at what the, the contributors to that stress were to understand, because it's a very fair point. If recognizing that if someone is, is struggling with a chronic condition, their stress level goes up, and that's another contribution to that. Uh, so we did actually look at that to make sure that when we were evaluating that, that they did not impact our results as well. The other piece of that, though, was individuals who actually did have a higher relationship to, to higher relationship to stress due to their chronic condition. We also looked to understand was there an improvement even for those individuals because not only were we measuring what might have contributed it, but those individuals that had that higher level, especially if somebody was dealing with something like a cancer, which we know can really put them off the charts in terms of, of perceived stress, those individuals too to see if we did, if people were able to, to live more comfortably with being able to manage that. And we did start to see some in incremental improvement even for those individuals, uh, but we did want to look at the population two ways. Over here. Hi, Paul. Hi. Um, 
So you mentioned that, this, that the uh, students had homework. What was the nature of the homework and was it different between the physical participation group and the, and the virtual online participation group? Sure. So uh, the homework that they were given in the mindfulness group was actually a focus on, it's really it was specific to practice exercises that they could do at home. So it included things like breathing. It also uh, was related to understanding their triggers and what may cause those triggers. Um, and, and there was also a focus for those individuals to practice the technique. Um, the individual within the, the yoga group actually was, it was similar exercises as well. It was focused on specifically on, again, practicing technique, repeating that technique, and being, and really working again to understand where their triggers were as well, and then using those two. So they were both coming back, uh, and then, uh, excuse me, one other piece of that is the group with the DVD was instructed to also follow the DVD as well. So they not only were given kind of a basic instruction, but they also had the DVD to watch. So they had a little bit more homework in terms of requirement. But it really was reapplying the discussion as well as the concepts that were shared in class to really reinforce that message, recognizing that many of these individuals had not had that type of exposure experience prior to coming in. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, I was wondering if you could give me an idea on the generalizability of the study, uh, namely the population that was tested. Was this employees who were told to report for the study, or were these volunteers who were kind of interested in this from the very beginning? And, and help me understand sure. how, how this could be applied to a population that may be less interested in the mind-body sure. connection. So we, had, we opened this up for individuals that were located in two locations. One was Connecticut and one was in California. And it was opened up to everyone in, the, in those sites. So that was this, the actual initial population started off at, uh, it was 7,500 in the Connecticut location. And then there was another 5,000 out in the California location. And then they were, it was really based on, we, were, we had a population size of 240 to 250 that we were accepting for the study, so it was really on a first come, first serve basis. There was no, no one was required to participate, it was completely voluntary, and they all understood that their data would be descrubbed so that nobody would be attached, and the, the highest level of confidentiality was maintained, recognizing that they did have an employer relationship as well, to, so that the, it, that didn't cloud their judgment of, of, of interest and participation. Those, those groups, again, we saw a very good response. And in fact, we actually saw a higher, even at the beginning, California was much faster to respond. I, I know, I know. <laughs> we weren't testing that theory. But, uh, but, but Connecticut actually had a higher reported stress. So what was interesting about that when those, two, when those kind of two locations came through, and part of the reason for those physical locations is because we had the, you know, looking at, again, kind of different extremes, different cultures and, and, and support, as well as the physical locations. Um, as we think about the relevance back to kind of the broader audience of, of how do we reach individuals, part of it is, is getting, is, number one, helping to understand what's in it for that individual. Because when we put the word mindfulness out there, there is a general resistance. Uh, people are very concerned around that, and to be honest with you, the label of stress is also a deterrent. People don't enjoy, at least, the, at least the feedback we've received and what we've seen from a data perspective is people don't like to be labeled as being stressed. And someone who is struggling with a chronic condition is sometimes embracing that and they're, they're, dealing, they're living with that every day. They don't want to be put into a program that is stress, stress managed. So as we, as we think about reaching alternative uh, our, our different populations. Part of it is going out with a program that they understand kind of where, what is the core? What are they, what is really in this for them? And then understanding what key elements are being delivered. What's interesting is, is that we also, there's also a need to educate on what yoga means to individuals because people have heard of yoga and they, there's certain things that they might think of or certain concepts, but they're really not comfortable with what it really, what it really means for them. So helping them to understand. So even being able to provide some type of demonstration or overview as well. But out of a workforce of 7,500 people, how many people expressed an interest in participating? The, we, had, we had about, in total, we had about 80% 80, 80 participation in that, or excuse me, 80% outreach actually requested to participate in the pilot. Okay. And then just to, to kind of follow that through, we've actually rolled out mind-body programs further we have 100% participation. And when I say we have each class now, as we, as we roll out different classes, each time they're filling up. And the class sizes have gotten bigger. So we're offering multiple 
we're offering multiple sessions. But what, what is also happening is that because part of the education process that had occurred, there's a, there's a greater comfort. The virtual classes are still much more popular than the physical location, which is partially, I think, due to people's portability and flexibility, as well as the convenience of it. So we've learned some things about um, incentives and how they work and don't work, sure. and the idea of getting somebody to the trough and then having them drink and then continue to drink. So uh, we talked a little bit about the longevity of the effect, but the, the issue of how you get people to recognize and be able to behaviorally change uh, so that it's an effect that's going to be long mm -hmm. could also be affected by what we know about organizations such as um, a culture of health right. or the kinds of things that um, leadership uh, guidance, all those kinds of things. I'm wondering if it would be, if you've thought about or tested the idea of the mindfulness in a very well situated um, best practice mm -hmm. organization versus one that is not. Mm -hmm. We've, and we've looked a lot at uh, different, different types of organizations who have embraced and those organizations that have established, and I would say that when we started, if we had a scale of one to 10, I would say we all started off at a one with awareness, with a comfort, um, and we've, I think we've progressed a long way. Because we do have executive support, to your point, there's a culture, there's an acceptance, because part of it is that's time people are taking away from their day, and now they need to, uh, you know, is, uh, is leadership supportive of them stepping away to, to really take, take, take this action in their life? Um, so we have looked at, you know, really where it, it can be the most successful. Cultures where they have a stronger wellness culture, meaning it, it isn't just where we're applying this type of program. And we looking at things, like you could look at smaller firms, like a law firm that we've seen great success with, and they have a very small, intricate office where communication is very quick. Incentives are not necessarily being applied, but there's an acceptance of people taking time during the day and scheduling, and, we've, and that seems to be where there's, there's great uptake. When you get to a larger organization where you have individuals who are Multi multiple demographic locations, you have people who are working from their own homes versus being in the office. Each of those things does play in. And part of it, where the, the best embracement comes is where there's strong communication really from the top through the leadership in the organization, but also bringing in specific, bringing in specific initiatives throughout the year. So it's not just a one-time event uh, where people feel comfortable and they recognize, now is the time I can take an action. And if it's not this solution, and this kind of gets into a broader discussion that I think we could really have of, does the organization have a number of different solutions to support them? So we're not just looking at one, really one strict program, but do we have multiple? Do you have some type of coaching solution in place? Do you have some other type of virtual classrooms? Do you have some type of face-to-face -face service or support, even in your community, if it can't be offered through the workplace? And I think that really talks to how do we reach people when they're struggling in their own life to make that decision. I think I'm ready, but I'm not sure where to start. And so having multiple solutions it does seem to help support, and that's where we've seen probably the greatest success overall. Okay. Uh, in your results, did you find any negative effects? Means where the stress levels went up, because I'm aware of at least one study sure. with mindfulness mm -hmm. meditation that the actual stress levels do go up. One of the impacts that we had seen, actually one thing that people struggled with, and we got a lot of very candid feedback, was that the hour time frame What's interesting about that was it did actually increase stress specifically for individuals because most individuals, if they're taking an hour lunch, they need time. So the people who are physically going to that classroom setting actually were, they didn't report higher stress when it came time for the class and they actually contemplated more of the time that they were not gonna participate because of other priorities and they didn't always feel like they could personally do it. Not that they were being, being restricted from doing it from their leadership, but it was actually that they personally just didn't feel they could step away for that period of time. So we did take that feedback. We didn't adjust any of the timings in the class, although that feedback did come back even during the time frame. But as we've, as we've continued to look at that and we've continued to do studies, we've actually started to try to change those time frames a little bit so that we don't lose the impact of the sessions, but, then from, but that people are able to really start and stop on time. The other, from the overall results, the, the, where, we had, where we did see, I would say the results the overall outcomes were positive across the board, so we did see those individuals that stayed with throughout, we did see positive results. Um, we did not see anything specific that indicated that 
or what I'd say like a, an increase in, in blood pressure or an increase in even weight if we were testing in that scenario. A couple of things, and maybe you said it and I just don't recall. Did you say that these people who participated were allowed to choose the channel they wanted to use? It was actually, they were, they were allowed to, they identified that they wanted to participate, but they actually randomized so that individuals were, uh, were identified and then, then they were notified of which, which, they'd be per, which they would be uh, placed into. Oh. So, if, so for example, control group, they didn't know that they were gonna be in the control group, they were notified that they would be in that. Okay, and is there a reason you chose yoga? Mm -hmm. And were you comparing the mindfulness sessions mm -hmm. with yoga? And could you have chosen a jogging program or another type of program? So what mm -hmm. is the reason you chose to compare it to yoga or maybe, and were you even comparing it? Or were you just using yoga as another option of, of way pe people can reduce stress? We looked at, it's a great question, thank you. The, the, we really looked at it at a couple of, from a couple different perspectives. Uh, we did not want to have a, what I'd call a physical program, like a running program. Uh, we're really, we were really looking for different ways that interest people to help them to engage. Mindfulness, as we looked at this, as well as meditation, it kind of mindfulness meditation and yoga, were really two different ways for individuals to engage. Some people are more comfortable in different settings, and that's really where we wanted to, to test the physical components such as that. Uh, while we've seen good results in, historically with studies that we've wanted to conduct, uh, we didn't want to necessarily introduce that as another leg because our, our feeling was and some individuals will continue to to really focus on whether it's activity they might be in a coaching program those were were key pieces but what we really were trying to understand is does meditation and does yoga have an impact comparatively is one maybe bring a greater level of significance than another what we found is that they were very close uh, but we've overall the result we felt very strong that both kind of bringing both together at different times offering both were were kind of a good course solution as, as another alternative, did you think about looking at heart rate variability training and mm -hmm. resonant frequency as the kind of biobehavioral feedback loop of exactly the same thing as, mm -hmm. as yoga? We did, we did actually use a heart rate monitor as well for individuals as part of the kind of the pre and the post. Uh, we used um, a system that was really just intended to see if there, if we did start to see some improvements as well in terms of uh, overall, and so those results again continue to be. I don't think we saw as high of an impact specifically in that area, but we did. We did want to make sure that we looked overall on on that component as well. Was there? A, I'm sorry. Was there a question up here? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, I do thank you all for your time today. I appreciate it. And uh, if anyone has any other follow-up questions after, please don't hesitate to stop by. Thank you.